opening statement on behalf of the state. Mr. Restless, you may proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to be going back to uh, 2012, and we're going to be taking you there through video, photographs, um, testimony, uh, and show you what happened on September 3rd, 2012, approximately 40 minutes after midnight. And we're going to be taking you to a place in Titusville. This is Smith Drop, if there's a home that was owned by the defendant, his family, the Woodwards, and they lived on Smith Drive, and there was a road, Lee, Lee Road, that separated those two residences. Directly across the street of Lee Drive was the Hembury residence, and uh, Gary Kimberly lived there with Kim Castillsbury, some children, and uh, Roger Kapoor was a resident there as well. Roger Kapoor and Gary Kimberly are the people that are dead from this, this incident. Next door to the Kimberleys uh, were the Blakes, and that's uh, Gary Blake and Bruce Timothy Blake. And, and Bruce Timothy Blake is the other person that was shot in this incident. The events that culminated in this killing arguably began approximately a month before. And you'll learn much of this from statements from the defendant himself, as well as other witnesses in the case. But it appears that there was a present that was for a child that was uh, left on the front doorstep of the uh, Woodward home. And Mr. Woodward reached the conclusion that it was Gary Kimberly's daughter that did that. And the way he decided to handle that situation was to call a police officer and walk over to Mr. Henry's house with the police officer and accuse the daughter without any real evidence. It was a hunch or a suspicion. And that made Gary Henry mad. And things flowed from that. Mr. Henry, according to the defendant, reacted by taking some pictures of his backyard. Well, Mr. Woodward had uh, created a flock of chickens in his backyard. I believe there were about 50, if is what you will learn. And those chickens had been there against code. And the defendant saw Mr. Henry outside with his phone, apparently taking pictures from his yard and in the street. And he became enraged. And his reaction was to go out into the street and challenge Mr. Henry to a fight, which Mr. Henry declined. He stayed, he stayed in his yard and uh, you know, suggested the defendant cop that Mr. Woodward come into his yard. That's, that's essentially what, how Mr. Woodward described it. So I'm giving his view of what happened. Things didn't get better. Right? They got worse. Um, the neighbors, and uh, what's interesting about this is uh, Kerry Blake, Kim Silsbury, they got involved as well. And they began name calling, threatening acts, and really the, the behavior is, uh, is bad. It's inexcusable what they were saying to the Woodwards. And some of it you'll hear on the tape uh, that was ultimately set up at the house. But they, uh, 
use foul language. They, uh, uh, the women threatened to get somebody to rape the daughter. Uh, there were uh, discussions about fights uh, or getting Mr. Woodward arrested for fighting. There was behavior like mooning. And so there was times when men would come because they knew there was a camera. They knew that Mr. Woodward had gotten a camera and they moved it and uh, made rude or crude remarks as well. These things are happening in the street. They're not happening on Mr. Woodward's property. And they're happening days, weeks before this killing happened. And you're going to need to look and see how this, this situation evolves. Because you're going to be seeing a video from this security camera. And uh, we're going to show you several hours of it that evening, the defense may show you more. Um, and so you're going to get to see what was happening leading up to Mr. Woodward making the decision to kill these people because that's what he did. You're going to see and you're going to hear uh, that there was a party over at the Embry Blake residences. In fact, the party was mostly between the residences, which is basically a house and a half. You've got the road, the Henry residence, and then between the yards is kind of where this party was happening. And uh, you'll hear from uh, Justin Couture, who is between 15 and 17 at the time. Um, and he was there. There were some other young people there. You'll see some of them running away. And they're all 15, 16 years old. I believe there was three of them. And Mr. Kerr will explain who was there that he recalls. The, at, at the time, that this is happening, uh, Gary Henry's in the house. He's inside his residence with Kim Katz. You'll see uh, the defendant, Mr. Woodward, crawling. You'll see him when a vehicle drives by and he'll be in full camo gear and he'll tell Officer Anderson and you'll hear his statement immediately after and you'll be able to hear the tone of his voice and you'll be able to hear why he did this killing. And, it's, and, and when you hear him it's not uh, justified what he's described which is why we're here. And he'll tell and you'll see Mr. Woodward crawling on the ground toward his truck. You'll see a car coming. You'll see him fall back out of the way. And then you'll see him sort of hunched over, go to the truck and lay down next to the truck. That's approximately 10 minutes after 12 that that's happening. He is out there and, and there's a point where you lose sight of him where he has crawled into the side yard, according to what he says, where he's there uh, listening. And he's, he's uh, concealing himself, and he says he can hear things. And you're going to get to listen to the tapes, and you'll decide what can be heard or not. Now, Mr. Woodward decided 
describes himself as a warrior in this thing. And he describes himself as a hunter, killer. And that the people that he shoots are his prey. And that he's at war with them. He'll concede that they were unarmed. And you will appreciate that from the position he was in, he would be able to know that. Not that far. And there was lights coming on and off because of motion lights. There were people walking around. When you see someone walk around to yell at his house, and they do. They say things about his mother. They say things about his father. They called him a plastic G.I. Joe because Mr. Woodward identifies with the military. And um, they were definitely insulting towards him. You're going to hear those things. They weren't threatening. They were drunk. That's what you're going to conclude. And you're going to learn that, yes, they were impaired, at least the two that were killed, we know the blood alcohol they had in them. One of them had about a 0.10, which is too much to drive. Another one had a 0.09, which is too much to drive. The only one we don't have the alcohol result on is Mr. Blake. He survived, so we don't have an autopsy report on him. But you'll learn and you'll hear from his testimony that he was impaired. And he'll tell you anytime he starts talking about fishing lures, which is what the conversation was when this was when this incident happened. He's drunk. That's what he tells you he always talks about. It. So you learn from Mr. Pacor that they were horse, he was horsing around with his father and pinched him and they just had a little struggle. And then they were talking about fishing. And so when they started talking about fishing, that uh, Mr. Blake talked about his lures, and they, the three of them who were near a truck parked on the roadway between the Henry and the Blake house, were walking towards Mr. Blake's residence to go look at the lure. And that's when Justin heard someone running up. And that person was Mr. Woodward. And Mr. Woodward was com coming up from behind him. And he turned and saw Mr. Woodward coming up. And he reacted, whoa. He had a reaction. And he had that reaction because he knew Mr. Woodward wasn't supposed to be around them, that there was a contentious situation. I think he's even going to admit that he yelled something over uh, disparaging to Mr. Woodward's residence. So he knew that was a problem. He then watched Mr. Woodward point the gun at his father at very close range and shoot him in the head. He then observed Mr. Woodward head in the direction of Mr. Blake, who was running away, running to his house to get away when Mr. Woodward shot him uh, repeatedly. And Mr. Picour uh, got on the ground um, told, I believe, told Mr. Woodward not to shoot him, and then he ran off towards Mr. Uh, Embry's house, because that's where his father stayed. Where that happened, I believe he'll tell you, saw uh, after Mr. Woodward had shot Mr. Blake multiple times. I think it's going to be You'll, you'll see the number of shell casings. There were 27 recovered. Mr. Woodward says there was 31 total, so the police didn't find four. There were more than 10 shots at or in Mr. Blake. Mr. Woodward, when he talked to the police, described him as dead. He believed he killed him. Mr. Woodward then, according to Justin K. 
came back and shot his father in the head again. You learn from the medical examiner there are only two bullet holes in Mr. Kaur, uh, and they're both in his head. And I'll describe those to you, so you'll and you'll see them. While the shooting is going on, you'll learn from Kim Cass Silsbury that she and Mr. Hembury are in the house, and Mr. Uh, Hembury thinks it's fireworks. He's, he's impaired, as I told you. And he wants to go out and see what's going on uh, with the party. And he does. And Mr. Woodward greets him essentially in his carport. And you'll see where the shell casings are. But he's in the carport of Mr. Hembury's residence and begins shooting him with Miss Katz right behind him. Now she's impaired too and she's going to tell you they were all drinking too much and they are loud and boisterous and having a loud boisterous uh, Labor Day celebration and some of that's to the ex expense of the neighbors and there's venom directed towards the Woodward home. She'll tell you that she's looking the other direction. She's looking towards a, a shed in their carport, and she feels, uh, she hears the, the shot here and feels uh, Mr. Henry on her back, and he basically causes her to lose her balance, and they both fall to the uh, rock floor or carport uh, cement floor, and she uh, is hearing the shots and, and, and ends up under the black automobile. She actually is under the car and turned around and seen Mr. Henry as he shot. And she'll tell you that the person that's shooting him, she never saw uh, the face. The person that's shooting him leaves a little bit and then comes back around the car and starts shooting again. And he's shooting close range into, and she's seen the shots into Mr. Ember. Mr. Ember was shot 14 times. You'll learn that the firearm that Mr. Woodward was using was a Ruger. Well, not, it's not a Ruger, it's a Beretta. And it had a clip that held 15 rounds. And he indicated that when he started the, his endeavor to kill these people, that one round was in the chamber. So he had 16 rounds in the firearm to start with. And he had a full magazine for, uh, for, a, for a total of 31. Two of those went into Roger Core. Many of them went into Mr. Blake. And the rest went into uh, Mr. Hemper. Now when uh, Mr. Woodward uh, finished shooting Mr. Hembury, and you can see that how much anger there's directed when you look at, at the, this type of shooting. I mean, it's up and down his body. It's at a close range. This is, this is an anger shooting. This is not a fear shooting. Mr. Woodward is, indicates that he was going to go back over and shoot Mr. Blake some more to make absolutely certain he was dead, but, is, but could not do that because he'd run out of ammunition when he was shooting Mr. Hembry. But that was his intent. See a the video that I described is that's coming from the uh, residence of Mr. Woodward. So you're going to see, and you can actually look at the amount of time that's passing, time for reflection and decision making. You're going to hear Mr. Woodward as he describes why he's doing these things. And the reasons that he's doing these things is because of his belief that the Titusville Police Department 
won't solve his problems. And Judge Moxley, uh, a judge, wouldn't solve his problems. And to some extent, he appears to accuse our office of not solving his problems. And so Mr. Woodward was going to solve his own problems. And that's what he did here. And that's what's going on. This is not a situation where these people were anywhere but over in their own yard at that particular point in time, minding their own business. And that's not to say they not been over uh, in the street, wounding him, <laughs> calling him names, cussing about his parents, and doing all these other things. But you'll see that is 20 minutes before, 15 minutes before, it's not happening when he does this. And you'll be able to see him run through the light and then you'll hear the gunshots. So I ask you to play, pay close attention uh, to the evidence in the case uh, and do justice, whatever that is. Thank you very much.